Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Still Peaking. Today on the show, we have my friend Eric, who is currently a director at Commerce Hub, but also previously worked at startups, a Cypher Wallet, which was a YC company, as well as Clubhouse. Thank you so much for joining me, Eric. Hey, excited to be here. We are both small town kids, me from a dinky town in Arizona and you from Montana, which I yeah. think I only know one city from Montana. Which um, city? You don't know one city, do you? <laughs> Hel- Helena? No, that's right. That's right. That's the capital. That's okay. The capital. Okay. Okay. Let's just start there and tell me about how everything started. So my parents ended up in Montana, this weird story of my parent, my dad wanted to be a professor, moved over here in the immigrant surge, came to San Francisco in particular, and then followed this professor to Nevada, and then followed that same professor to Montana, and then peaced out to go to Korea. And then we became a satellite family, and that's how we ended up in Montana. Your dad was a professor? An uh, aspiring professor then, and then became a professor in Korea after the fact. Okay, my dad was a professor. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's a common thing of Asian parents to become a professor. Yeah, I think academia was the sexy job back then. I don't get it though, because it's like, it, my dad worked so many hours and like, yeah. he supported us, but you still don't make that much money for the hours you work. No, but I think it's a stable income. Maybe it's the academic version of social work. You know how social work is really sexy in Asian countries? Yeah, yeah. Because you, um, you get a great pension and you never get fired. Yeah, yeah. But then growing up, my dad was like, never become a professor, never do research. It's too much work for too little money. My dad really wanted me to become a professor, actually. But I was like, dude, I cannot do a PhD. There's no shot in hell that I'm ever going to do that. But yeah, Montana, for your first question, was really tough, honestly. Like, great place to hike outdoors, very chill, very low cost of living. It's kind of what you describe as a rural area. I always tell people this story, which is, my nickname in high school was just Asian. That was delineating enough that that was my nickname in high school. <laughs> just Asian? Just Asian. Not Korean, not Chinese, just like Asian. And I was like, hey, Asian. And then I would turn my head and that would be my nickname in high school there. Were you the only Asian kid? No, I wasn't. There was more. I would say there was like five to 10. But I think a lot were either under the radar or just not in the friend group or okay, something. So you're but... really the popular kid. No, no, I was not popular at all. If I describe my life, it was I fucking hated high school, loved college, and you know, post college life is traumatizing as it is for everybody. But high school was horrible, severely bullied, was not cool to study. I think I got made fun of for even wanting to go to college outside of the state. Everyone was like, hey, you should just go to Montana State. Why would you want to leave? And so, I don't know, fish out of water a little bit my whole time there. So yeah, I would not recommend raising kids there for sure. Huh. So were you in Helena or a different city? Bozeman. Bozeman, Montana. Apparently it's Bozeman. a hot spot for all the other people that to go skiing. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So you didn't go to like a very academically focused high school either. No, I went to the <laughs> one public high school in the area. 99. Nice. And how was that? Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch any movie. High School Musical, Red Lockers, you have the jocks, you have the goths, you have the band geeks. That's exactly how my experience was. I think for me, it was particularly hard because I was a soccer player, so part of the jocks, but also had these aspirations for wanting to go to a good school. Mm -hmm. And then it was fine until junior year where I started skipping soccer tournaments to go study for an AP test or study for my SATs. And then I got severely shunned, severely bullied. Someone put rice in my locker, for example. I don't even know how they got the combination. Like open and like rice. It's very not traumatizing, but it's like very quintessential. You think of a movie of like your standard yeah. American experience. That was it, you know. And so I do not look fondly at high school. <laughs> do not look fondly at Montana. But I think life after that has been pretty fantastic. Huh. So then, how did you? I mean, did you do well in school? And then how did how did you decide to go to Brown? <sighs> the short answer is like, my sister went to Brown. I did not do that well in school. I got good grades, but I didn't have good extracurriculars. I wasn't very motivated. And I don't know, I think it was like hard for me to put myself out there given the scenarios of high school. But mm-hmm. I think luckily I had the SAT score and the GPA to get into Brown. Didn't have the extracurriculars to quite honestly get in, but I think they cut you some slack if your sister went first. And so legacy. I kind of, yeah, legacy, exactly. So not quite as strong, I think, as like a parent, but still legacy. 
So I don't think I deserve, honestly, to go to Brown. I'll be blunt there. I do think I took advantage of all the resources there, and I'm proud of myself there, but I don't think I deserve that original spot. And I'll be super transparent about that. Did you feel not deserving because when you went to Brown, you were like, oh, everyone is way more impressive and way better than me? Or is this more just a personal feeling? So so my first year at Brown was really challenging for my identity crises, because a huge premise and thesis of high school for me was those four years of pain to get into this great school, but then I'd be understood. And the second I get there, I get told, told like, by, I wasn't super well-spoken either. So I get told by a ton of people that I speak weird because I spoke similar to my friends from Montana. I got told I was like too white to be in the Asian crew. And then the hardest part was like some geographic diversity as well. I think someone quote unquote told me I was a ret- any retard quote unquote could get into Brown from Montana. So it was like this existential crisis of oh, shit, I don't fit in. I feel like maybe it wasn't worth it. And I'm really struggling academically because these kids just know how to study out of the gate. And they, on top of that, know how to party. And so my favorite quote from my sister was, like, there's kids at Brown who know how to party, know how to study and do it all. You are not one of them. Mm-hmm. And so I tried to study more. And I think I got my habits eventually after a year and was able to do well. But that first year was really tough. I feel like going to a public high school wouldn't you know how to party? I went to a really nerdy high school, so I never went to any parties. But I feel like other high schoolers had a different experience. Oh, I mean, I so I drank. I guess why I said I drank and did stuff in high school, probably earlier than most people, because it's super rural. But it wasn't yeah. the same type of party, and it was less about like, how to party. It was more like how to s- manage the academics at mm-hmm. Brown while still on the binary partying. Cause I think school was frankly so easy in Montana because people weren't academically driven, but then Brown was super, super hard relative to high school. And so mm-hmm. I just couldn't keep up. I didn't have the habits. Kids would just go to the library all day and then be super focused till 8 PM and then go out. I was right. not that person. I was not used right. to sitting down and I just struggled a ton. Um, yeah, did you did party, you were, you had fun. <laughs> Yeah, it was still college. It was still college. I just tried to be more disciplined. I built a ton of discipline in college. Like high school, I didn't deserve Brown, but I think Brown uh, deserved my performance there and worked really hard there to make up for it. Yeah, because that's something I think about a lot where if you're not, if, if you didn't grow up building those habits of how to study and how to work hard and like spend a lot of time on academics, it's really hard to find that self-discipline to give yourself the structure and motivation to do it later. Yeah, no, I, I, my wife will kill me for saying this, but I give all my, I give all credit to my ex-girlfriend who came from <laughs> a competitive private high school and she just yeah. knew how to fucking study. So she'd be like, we're on a study date and we're going to study from here to here. And then we're going to go out to dinner and then we'll go out and just kept me disciplined. And then we stayed okay. together for the rest of college. Like, Thanks to her, I think I got study habits down. Um, yeah. A huge shout out to her for that. That was really great. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you would have made it on your own without her? Oh, I don't know. Probably not, honestly. I wish I could say that, but she was so crucial in building that habit for me. Mm-hmm. Um, she made studying a lot more fun. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, like, we broke up because she was in New York and like, we aged out of it. So like, I have no ill will towards her, but yeah. yeah, definitely not. My friends are, my male friends were not the best at, <laughs> at studying here. They definitely weren't going to help me. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think who we hang out with in college is so important because I dated someone who wasn't in school, which is totally fine, but he also wasn't really doing anything else. And I feel Mm. it held me back from a lot of opportunities where I was still doing really well in school. I still, you know, had extracurriculars, but I just wasn't as social. I wasn't as excited to go meet new people. And on the weekends, we just watched TV and it felt pretty complacent. And looking back, I'm like, oh, that was not a good decision on my part for myself. Was it enjoyable, though? I feel like as long as it was enjoyable, you still sort of get a good life experience from it. No, we also fought a lot because <laughs> I think... I I, be like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, he knows. I think it's a fair assessment where like, we fought so much because we were just two very different people. Perfectly mm-hmm. fine guy, but I wanted to live a very like, go-getter kind of life pace whereas he was more get off work go to a bar relax and chill and I think inherently I was always at odds with that and Mm. we just were not on the same page about what we wanted out of life but then I was also very caught up in the whole 
there's no perfect person for you, so you just have to make it work. And I tried to make it work for two years, and it was a very rough two years. You're being super young, at least. It's funny because my ex and I didn't work out for what in hindsight was probably a lot of red flags for both of us, but we were so young, right? And for me, the reason I dated her was again, from the Montana to like here, I met the first girl, which was her, happened to be Asian. She just understood, oh, my yeah. parents cared about studying, her parents cared about studying, which is like, I felt really understood. And that was frankly a low bar, just like, hey, we're both Asian. But that is sort of the reality of how it happened. Um, and right. then I guess, you know, you get older and you become more specific with what you want. So I mm -hmm. guess that makes sense. Were there a lot of Asians at Brown? I would like to say yes, but it might be because I hung out with a lot of Asians. Um, no, I think it was still a lot because what is it? Four four percent of the US population is Asian. Okay. And I think Brown was like sixteen or twenty percent. So it was pretty yeah. outside, like a high amount of Asians. Okay. And then was it different? Because I feel like Asians who grow up hanging out with a lot of white people mm -hmm. are very turn out kind of very white. And then so even when I hang out with Asians who grew up very white, I can I can sense that there's a little bit of a difference. And was it hard for you to transition from like hanging out with a lot of people in Montana to a very Asian heavy school? It was super. I mean, it was super hard because I think a lot of people one because they came from more academic backgrounds, were nerdier, much more conservative, and I was very brash with my and crude with my speech. And then too, yeah, it was I was pretty not only white but rural white coming into this more sophisticated institution. Mm -hmm. But you have a good point. I debated with my friends too, where it's like, even at Brown, there was like, the simplest bifurcation was probably like your New York, maybe not New York, but like East Coast grown Asians versus your West Coast grown Asians, where I felt like the West Coast Asians, because they had that crew, they didn't have that Asian identity like insecurity. They were like yeah. super confident. Like, yeah, I'm Chinese American. I'm Korean American. I love this about my culture. Whereas it felt like East Coast, they had to integrate more. And therefore there was more of trying to balance that. I don't want to make it look more negative, but it feels like it was foregoing Asian culture more. And I felt like that was an interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, I don't know. And, and then there's you, the Midwest Asian. Yes, the Midwest <laughs> Asian. Everyone thought I was from, no, the funny thing is everyone thought I was from California though, eventually because of, I grew up on YouTube. That's how, that's what described my Asian culture for me. Cause I was this Asian kid in Montana watching Ryan Higa, Kev Jumbo, Wong Fu Productions only. And I was like, oh my God, that's right. what it means to be Asian anywhere else but Montana. And so I would say hella a lot. I really wanted to go to UC Berkeley, but my mom wouldn't let me, all that stuff. I watched a ton of Ryan Higa too growing up, yeah. but also because I just thought he was cute. <laughs> he is ridiculously good looking. Yeah. Then you went through Brown, your ex-girlfriend got you through, you know, trained you on all the good study habits and stuff. Mm. And then, and then what? Did you have aspirations going into college of what you wanted to do no i i had nothing college was the end state goal as i feel like it was for a lot of asian kids where it's like you right. want to get into harvard but you don't think about the next click with what do you actually want to do with it right. i think it's actually a huge disservice because i think you sort of trust the system that getting into a good college would allow you to get a good job and it does but it's usually because you're not thoughtful about it it's typically what i call a funnel job so consulting banking law maybe tech to some capacity now. I mean, I think tech is a little bit better, but no, but I had no idea. I think by the time I was halfway through college, I had this aspiration to work at American Express. And that was because it was like my sister's boyfriend at the time worked there and he said he loved it. And I was like, that sounds great. And I get to live in New York, work at American Express. That's the dream. And so that was, that was my dream job for like, mm -hmm. I don't know, half of college. Doing what, or just did it matter? Just being at American. It doesn't America. matter. Whatever he did. I think he did some kind of, a, I don't know what he did, like corporate strategy or something or internal consulting at American okay. Express. Yeah. But yeah, I basically wanted to be him because he just seemed chill and liked his job. And uh -huh. I was, that was the end of my aspirations. Right. And then eventually you went into consulting. So like, how did that happen? I actually wanted to do finance. But so like, let's, let's take a step back. I, sophomore year, I randomly did this one week program in sales and trading at Bank of America. Uh, so, okay, trading sounds cool. I think at the time also Wolf of Wall Street just came out. So I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Toxic males banging their chest, making a fuck ton of money. Why wouldn't I want that? I'll That's me. I can see yeah, myself. Exactly. <laughs> and then, I mean, I was super insecure, but they just had this like, random Barclays sales and trading interview loop. I applied, got it. And I was like, 
that was a huge unlock. I remember I was on a train back from New York and I was like, oh my God, I just got a job from Barclays. That's amazing. And then somehow that got converted to this Bank of America sales and trading. And then, you know, at the time, Bank of America was ranked higher for some arbitrary on Wall Street oasis. So pick that kind of brain dead. I did sales and trading, was going to go back because I got the desk that I wanted at the time, which was credit trading. I don't even, and again, the only reason I wanted to do credit trading was because if you look at all the desk at BAML, that was by far their best desk. And so I was like, okay, I want that one. But you can see like, the theme here is like no critical thought. It was more just like decisions based off of maybe Google searches and like, what your impression yeah, of things were. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, basically if you're in college and you just like search the best colleges and you just pick based off what's higher. That's like the right. level of thought that went into my jobs, which was horrible. Yeah. And then honestly, like, the same thing with consulting, I wasn't going to recruit. My best friend wanted to do consulting as a break between college and medical school and asked me to coach him on casing. Mm -hmm. I randomly decided to case a lot sophomore year in case I wanted to do consulting because I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do IB, sales and trading or consulting. So I prepped for it. I was like, you know what? I prepped for it. I might as well recruit. And then that's when I got the Bain offer, ended up turning down Bank of America. But again, it was as simple as I asked a few people, which one would you take? Which one's more? Literally, I would ask which one is more prestigious? And they're like, Bain, hands down. And I was like, okay, now I'm going to Bain. <laughs> And Which one it. will give me more clout? Yeah, exactly. I think that th I remember it was a pay cut too. So it wasn't even money. It was just, I wanted to be that guy in the info session when there was like, people from Brown being like, oh, I want to be you. That was my definition of success. But you know, you're still the person working late and like, doing the shitty job of a Bain AC at the mm -hmm. job, right? It was horrible definition of success. But you can see how thoughtful I was. Not at all. Just, yeah. Just and then I guess going back, if you were in those positions again, would you have made a different decision? Would you have gone to Bank of America? Would you have thought about, you know, different career paths or would you have done the same thing? Oh, that's always tricky. Cause I feel like if I knew exactly what I wanted to do, I wish I had the like, courage to skip all of it and go straight to startups. Right. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, the context is important because at the time I was like hyper insecure. I was kid from Montana based off geographic diversity, didn't even know I could get interviews. I wanted to work at Amex as my dream job. So I think with that context, I think it turned out well. What I think mm -hmm. I wish I would have done though, is been more thoughtful about the why for all these jobs. Mm -hmm. So I think Bain is arguably one of the best jobs to open up the most breadth of doors, maybe not the depth. If you want to do finance, you should go banking, but it still opens up private equity. It opens up venture, opens up product, opens up tech stock. I feel like I had this door opener and then I just like, had choice paralysis and stayed. Right. And I realized I was, I viewed it as like, I'm just waiting for the perfect choice. But the reality was like, I was just choosing to stay at Bain and mm -hmm. kept choosing it over and over because I was so unsure about what to pick. And so if I have any regret is in college, I wish I was more thoughtful about the why and tried shit out. And then to like, come into Bain, I probably still pick that as my job. Mm -hmm. And then hey, this is exactly what I want from two years out of Bain, and then I'm going to go on this journey. Because, mm -hmm. I don't know, the one thing I learned from life is, like, theoretical is never helpful enough, but you have to go try stuff out. So right. you, like, at most, be 60% confident, and then you're like, okay, that's enough, let me go try it. And I, I wish I took more advantage of that, because I think I was sort of wasted two and a half years at Bain, knowing that I didn't want to do it long term. Right, because you were at Bain for five, five years? One and a half. Half. I feel like myself a half back. <laughs> so I'm five ten and a half. <laughs> I actually do do that, except for I'm five nine and one fourth. Let's go. <laughs> wow. I have a lot of consulting friends who just stay in consulting. They do two years, and then you're like, okay, what's the next thing? And then, mm -hmm. so did you just stay at Bain for that extra year and a half because you weren't sure what you wanted to do? I think, I mean, because the thing is, I, so in college, again, it was the prestige thing. So when I got into Bay and I was like, okay, everyone here is at Bay. Like, what do I want to do next? What's the most prestigious thing? Which was private right. equity, for sure. Right. It was like the pinnacle of your finance career. And then after that, maybe you go to like a crazy hedge fund, Viking or something. Yeah. So I just want to do PE and then I got burned. And that's when I think it was like, I quit. I quit like after like six months. It was where finally though, chasing the prestige thing didn't pan out. Cause I was like, oh, none of this really made sense. And so mm -hmm. I think I became very fearful. So at the time I, I had an opportunity to join DoorDash and I feel like that would have been more enriching and it would have driven the ball forward of like, what do I want to do? Mm -hmm. But 
just came back out of Bay for fear. And I, I still think it was a good decision, kind of, in the sense that it built my confidence back up after the fact. But largely stayed because Bain tells you internally that, hey, every single year you're here, you're and you're not sure what you want to do, you're still progressing your career because the more senior you get at Bain, the more your exit opportunities are, which is actually, now that I've left, is just not true, <laughs> right? Yes, you can get higher paying jobs, but you get more niche into these strategy roles and you work at startups, right? Like, mm -hmm. Essentially, strategy kind of has this weird, it's helpful as a support function, but it's not it's not like you're going to be a GM or you're not going to be like running a PNL. You're not actually like building anything. So it's, right. it's a very specific niche, I think. And so I think it's a disservice to a lot of Bainies and even to myself where it's, they make you feel like you're opening up more by staying, but you're actually closing more. And I think that's what I really regret. I think it was fear. It was the lie of I'm opening more doors and then not being super confident in a specific avenue. And I just like, even when I left Bain, I had three offers. One was at... Epic Games, which was a bigger company in gaming. One was Clubhouse, Sardo. And the last one was a hedge fund. So you can see like, for the things I fucking recruited for, it was like all over the fucking place. I had no right. clue. And when I decided, I just kept re-ranking. I was like, you know what, fuck it, let's just do Clubhouse. And then the rest is history. Right. So I, I guess before we dive into the what happened after Bain, what happened with private equity? Oh, dude. I mean... I'll put it this way. So I came to private equity because it just has this outsized amount of money you can make, right? Without taking yeah. a ton of risk. Not necessarily as an associate, but I mean, even the associates were making anywhere from three to four, and then you can make a lot of carry. And by your late 20s, you can probably break seven, which is what people told me. I don't know if it's true. never did it. So it could be all count. <laughs> but it really was, I think it was my first confrontation with work-life balance, like true definition of work-life balance. Not just like you versus sleep, but like you versus everything in your life. And so my relationship with my girlfriend was suffering severely because I had to like pick, I once had to pick her up from the airport, drop her off at home. She watched TV all weekend. I worked, picked her back up, drop her back off the airport. And that was the only, the drive basically was the only time we spent. And she flew from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. To see you. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. To see me. Um... She only saw me on the drive. Super understanding, but obviously not the best. My dad had some health issues and he's, and he's Asian. He's like, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But then I kept pushing back seeing my parents. I'm like, I just don't have time. I don't know if I have vacation. I have to focus on my career. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was obviously competition with just my own body. You're working, you're on a live deal 120 hours a week. And then you're, when you're down, it's still like 60. So it's not that chill. And yeah. then on top of that, it's not like you can plan for it. It's just like shit picks up sometimes and shit comes back down. Shit hits your desk. And so this other story I told people is like, I had this friend visit. And I told her, I'll tell you 30 minutes before if I can make dinner on Friday. That's like the earliest I can tell you. And then I, six o'clock, I was like, hey, I'm driving over. I can actually make it. Thanks for this flex. Halfway through my drive, I got a call from the MD being, new, de new deal hit your desk. Can you like, figure out an LBO for it by end of day? So I canceled, came back. And so it was just the constant, just mental of always being stressed, always worried about phone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, I just got really worn out. My relationships all sucked. And yeah, I was making a lot of money, but it wasn't enough to warrant all of that. Right. And so it kind of, that was like a thoughtful hindsight, but I just like rage quit one day. I think it was, I was doing all this work and then they said, you have to hop onto a flight to London tomorrow. And I was like, when am I going to work? I have to work on the airplane. They're like, I just work on the airplane then. I was like, all this shit. And I just got so stressed. I snapped. I was like, I quit. And I you walked just, out. You just quit in that moment? You just said you yeah, quit? Yeah. Baller. I went to this, my favorite <laughs> who I still talk to sometimes, he's the best. And I just like, broke down crying. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to regret this, but I quit. I'm sorry. I can't do this. And I left. And that's Did you, it. <laughs> you know how sometimes after you cry, you have like, some clarity where you're not caught up in the emotions anymore? <laughs> after yeah. that cry, where you like, what did I just do? I just like quit my job. I had that up and down for, like, I want to say, a whole year. It came to the point, like, even I regret, like, I, those times I regret quitting, there was, I wish I could do that cool story of, like, hey, I quit and like, never look back. But I actually ended up recruiting for PE firms again, because I was like, maybe it'd be different this time. And I always waver back and forth of whether I should have actually quit or not. Yeah. And I think the only reason I eventually got out of it was because I met people who, I think you mentioned, earlier, had the abundance mindset. Is why was I even framing my career as something that I have to survive through for 15, 20 years when it's, that's not very bankable, right? 
maybe I make it to MD and maybe I make tens of millions of dollars, but you have no idea if that gives you happiness. Whereas met all these people who are both really well off and had great marriages and all that stuff, which a lot of the P people I feel like didn't, but just enjoyed every single day. Didn't have to worry about getting seven hours of sleep, could work out, be healthy. I think mm-hmm. having that abundance mindset was when I finally was like, okay, I don't regret, I don't regret quitting. Right. I think it ended up being good, but it was, no, it was a very tumultuous mental journey there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's very common too, because it's not, you have to choose one or the other, but maybe sometimes the jobs that allow you to have both or have all of it, it's not immediately apparent. I couldn't tell you, oh yes, this one job will give you everything that you want in life. Work-life balance, a happy family, good pay, you know, eight hours of sleep there. And I think it takes work for someone to find it, which Mm -hmm. is why people fall into this trap of, oh, I have to go down private equity or, oh, I have to, you know, be a doctor, et cetera, to be successful because the other answer is, is harder to find. Yeah. And they're also well, they're well trodden, right? Like, you know exactly what you're getting yourselves into. I think people love yeah. the lack of ambiguity, right? It's two years of this, two years of that. And then there's always, there's always that like super senior person who's like, you know what? After 25 years though, it gets better. And so you can be like me. Yeah. When you're stressed, maybe, maybe it's because I mean, there's probably some truth of, Hey, the rise there is harder and it's like, it requires you to pay your dues. But yeah, I was like, oh, maybe I was just like, you know, being a bitch. I should have pushed through, et cetera, but right. um, maybe I'll still regret it one day, but for now, I think I've come to peace with it. Yeah. So then, you know, you quit private equity, went back to Bain and then after Bain, you, was it also throwing darts at a wall, just seeing what, where applications would land sort of thing? I'm trying to think, well, it was also around COVID. And so there was some tricky, there's a period where it's like people weren't hiring. Right. And then, yeah, I was just recruiting at venture firms, PE firms, hedge funds, companies, startups. I don't know how I balanced it, but I think I was always in a process while managing the main job, which was not PE, but it's still a 60, 65 hour per job, which just goes to show I really want to get something done and go try something else out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just kept doing that and then eventually got an offer from the hedge fund first. I was like, okay, I'm going to go try out hedge fund investing, mm-hmm. which I don't even know why I consider it because it's not that derivative of PE, I guess, but it's supposed to be better work-life balance. But then I think at the same time, Bain had offered this thing where, hey, you can take three months transition and you can have this offer to come back if you ever want. And at that point, I was like, okay, I have a job. I can take three months transition. If I don't fucking leave and explore, I will never leave, period. And I just need to leave. And so then I recruited and that's where I really heavily recruited, stuck everything to the wall. At that time, I was a big Clubhouse user. And then at that time, the two people I was most impressed with was my two bosses there, which is Arthi, in addition to Dan Ashton. And they were just world-class, super positive, super successful. I was really just drawn by them and became very obvious at the time that at least I want to try it out, even if it doesn't work out. And that's one thing for sure, where it was did not pan out well, Clubhouse, but it was by far my favorite career decision I've ever made, make it 11 out of 10 times. Yeah. Was Clubhouse, was Bane to Clubhouse like a big leap of faith moment for you? Huge leap of faith. <laughs> oh my God, I was so scared. Yeah, it was just finally, it was because of the second time I was leaving, right? And the first time was so bad. And I was like, what if I leave again? And I rubber band. I think you, I think because Bane offers this return offer back, if you do well, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a great golden parachute. To always go back to Bain. By the same time, it, it it lowers the bar of breaking to just go back. Because you're like, oh, I, I'll just go back to the safe environment. So a huge leap of faith. My first week at Clubhouse was actually really tough because I had no idea what I was doing. And yeah, I don't know. I just had no clue. I was super scared. I was like, maybe this was a mistake. I ended up crying that Friday. Being like, oh, fuck. I made a mistake. And then I ended up being literally from that one week beyond. Oh, well, one thing I love is I'll take huge credit for Arthi. I think she was aware. She could tell. She like sat me down and was like, hey, how was, how was your first week? How was your first sec- second week? I was like, it's good, good. I, the people, I got one-on-one. She's like, Eric, you didn't tell me a single bad thing. Just I didn't me. start crying. No, I didn't cry. Luckily, I didn't cry. I don't think I prayed for Arthi. I'll have to ask her. But luckily, I didn't cry. But I was like, yeah, I want to say I'm stressed because I only use Outlook. All of a sudden, I'm fucking using Gmail, which I don't know how to use Gmail, surprisingly. And now we have Notion. What the fuck is Notion? And like, yeah. it's just these tactical things. And then like, no one knows what bank consultants do. So I'm 
what am I doing? I have no idea how people do things. Also, Bain teaches you so much to like, over process everything. So I'm making slides, everyone's making bullets, and like, why are you making slides? So everything was just broken. I just look at this, look at this silly consultant. <laughs> yes, yeah, I made the sickest slide. And like, I remember Dan was he was super nice. He was like, Yeah, just for like teacher though, like, people don't really make slides here. Just like, don't do that. And I was like, what do you mean? That's, so and that's all I know how to do. <laughs> I thought that's what you hired me for. Yeah, exactly. It was like nothing, nothing I learned applied. But what I at the very end was, like, hey, just be chill. Give it a month. Slow down and it'll be fine. And I think that was like groundbreaking where just having that manager who takes good care of you was awesome. And then from there, it was a much more fun job, much faster. And I was like, eye open by how much you can do if you don't have to put everything in like, polished slides. Mm -hmm. And 100% to the same. Yeah. What was it? What was it that made you say, okay, I'm just going to swing for the fences and go to Clubhouse? And like, what were you trying to get out of that? Oh, oh, I remember this now. I think because a lot of consultants have this, they use that, that model, right? Which is, hey, work life balance, how much do you care? Wait it. And then you have money and then you have work content, you have people yeah. and you create this complicated model, it gives you some weighted score and you're like, okay, well, what the fuck does that mean? It means nothing. And then, so I distill it down to Clubhouse is the place where I probably won't have the best work-life balance. I won't make as much guaranteed money, but I'll figure out whether I care about content. And if that is the case, then I will continue down that. If that's not the case, then I'll swing for a work-life balance job and like chill. And I think when I realized, like, hey, content is super important for me, as simply as I was working really late at Bay and I can never know why. It would be, the reasons would be, like, oh, the partner has an hour before their kids wake up between 6 and 7 a.m. tomorrow. It's the only time we can get them to review the deck. They'll get it done by 6 a.m. no matter what. If that wasn't a reason, a high enough reason of why. But at Clubhouse, we've had problems where, hey, there's people getting attacked in cyber attack in a certain country and we need to protect their identity. So you stay up really late to help them scrape their accounts, ban it, and just protect people. And that makes more sense. You're like, this is literally impacting real people's safety or real people's lives. And the result was very obvious too. And so that was much easier. And so if you always had that kind of impact driven work, you also work a lot less You have a lot more impact. And it gave me a lot more meaning. The other thing about Clubhouse was like everyone was super positive and optimistic. Whereas consultants were, consultants were not. Like everything's downside protected, risk averse. They sat in the pedestal job. They're like, our clients are so stupid. I, okay, for the record, Bane, I love you. I'm sorry. This is not turning out great. But yeah, they always shout on clients. I didn't love that. It's that, the gladiator quote, right? Like, once you're the gladiator in the arena, you don't really shit on other gladiators. You only shit on gladiators when you're actually just in the stands. I'm not saying I'm a gladiator, but that's how it felt at Bane. Right. And then, I, I mean, obviously, Clubhouse had you know, it's very bright moment in the sun, early COVID and kind of fizzled out a little bit. So then when you decide, at what point were you like, okay, I need to move on. And how did you feel then? I mean, the things like, I always enjoyed the job. And so, and I was always optimistic that we can make something work. And there's plenty of stories of every, a lot of startups still having these spiky stories. And so maybe Clubhouse will still be successful. So it was less about Clubhouse not doing well, but it was more that the two, all my favorite people left. Mm -hmm. So we had the BizOps team. I had Ian and Faraz, who I love very dearly. They both left. And then the, the head of the ops team, Dan Ashton, left. And then Arthi left. And so at that point, I was like, okay, all the people I really love working with had all left. And so it became less fun, I would say, to work there. And then decided it was the right time to move on and try. And I learned so much there. So I also wanted to go to an earlier stage company, try head of ops, where you're basically owning everything on Eng. There was some like running towards things. There was also a little bit of running away in terms of didn't have the people that I had a ton of fun with prior. So it just felt like a good combination to leave then. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, especially in startups, who you work with matters so much because you're just in the trenches yeah. with them all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, new people weren't bad, but I was just really right. close to my old team. So it was right. more long for them. And it's harder to build, I think, after you've already had those set relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. So then, so then you went to Cypher Wallet, which is a Web3 crypto wallet company, right? And I, I haven't worked on Web3 projects at all. And how was that for you? Just like, 
very early was, stage Web3 company. It was super fun. If that had worked out, that would be amazing because it was mm-hmm. the most fun job that I think I've had where mm-hmm. we... The early team is basically family. We talk about everything from how much money we have, net worth, decisions that we made, why we pick our partner. We, they would meet each other's partners. You're so close and you're so honest because you feel so comfortable and everything feels like you against the world, right? And I think that's hard to emulate anywhere except for early stage or maybe tight knit teams. So mm-hmm. it was just a ton of fun. I find Web3 to be very, very interesting also. And so it was like a crash course on all the technicalities. All the things that went wrong, obviously, in the last bowl, you know, you get a perspective of whether it has a right to exist, period. And so it was a very interesting place to be at the time as well. But yeah, mostly, like, if I could still live, it was just really fun. Mm-hmm. And I was still learning a ton. And that's pretty much the short of why I loved it so much. It was like, super, super, super fun. And then what happened? We, I mean, <laughs> I joined <laughs> and then there was SBF doing all his stuff with FTX. There was like Silvergate, there was SVB, there was probably a lot of other stuff that I missed. And so what happened was we were going to raise another round. We had investors who had committed and then everyone pulled out because it was too tumultuous. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I was early, yes, but I wasn't the founder. And the founder decided that we're going to drastically cut back runway. And so shuttered all US ops as a team in India, still running, building all that stuff. And everyone in the US team let go. And that was the end of it. It was, it was an interesting journey of, I loved it. Was so heartbroken to hear it, honestly. But then we're still close friends. It was, it was ripping off the, st- the sticker, um, and turned out to be okay. But that's ultimately what happened, and it's like unfortunate timing. But again, maybe this is like me self insecure and like saying, oh, it's still fine. But like, one thing I do value is that we thread together all my experiences, and I had this fear of leaving Bain because of Luke's P thing. And then after Clubhouse, it was so great, but it didn't turn out amazing where everything was up and to the right. And so there was an insecurity of, was it just startups or was it actually just Clubhouse specific that I loved it? But having a second data point where it was like, hey, you actually really love it, builds so much more conviction that I just love this stuff and it is for me. And that was amazing, even if it ended as well. And so I would say longitudinally, I think startups are still where I want to be. And I built a lot of conviction there, which was really great. I also think there's something about, because startups are really risky, right? Like everyone knows that startups are really risky. And so I feel like your path was almost perfect for going from, you know, Bain, very safe, big corporate company to Clubhouse, larger, more established startup to then something even <laughs> more risky. And you're kind of wading deeper and deeper into the pool as you get comfortable, yeah. right? And then soon you'll be founding your own company. I don't know about that. I hope so one day. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people say that. I don't know if that'll actually happen. I hope so. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it's like the it's like math, right? The asymmetric upside. Like I was in consulting at arguably the five best years of the economy. And my upside was an extra 10K bonus and a pat on the back and easier to get promoted. And there's fucking people out here making millions of dollars off these bull runs. And it's not even just financial upside, right? Because if you're at a startup at a growing company, you take on more scope, you take, you manage more people, you have more impact. There's yeah. just so many things to do that literally they can't hire someone fast enough. So you end up doing it. So you grow a ton more and that compounds, 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 and you become a completely different person in, you know, five years. Whereas yeah. I think Bain was great, low job risk. Actually, I would say high career risk. It's just very steady state. There's no upside, no downside. You just kind of chug it on. So yeah, but it's now that I've learned that, yeah, I want to take as much risk as possible as long as I don't go bankrupt or hungry. Put it, to put it to context for people who are maybe earlier in their careers, how much learning would you say you would have in six months of startups in consulting time? Oh man, yeah, that's a good question. I kind of view consulting as a boot camp too, so it's fast. But I would say even on top of that, you're probably you're probably still if you're someone who's hungry, who's open to feedback, and have a good manager. I would say maybe it still is 10x faster. And I mm-hmm. shit you not on that, especially if it's growing faster. Right. I mean, you're a good example, right? You're managing a lot more people than people of your tenure at Bain would. You probably had a lot more. Okay, I'm just shitting on Bain, but you, you get where my bullet points are going. It's yeah. a lot of fast growth. I think the trade-off though is like, that's when all things go well. So I will say one thing for younger listeners is that 
one thing even after the fact I never got clarity on is whether a pit stop in a blue chip company is worth it. Mm-hmm. I think some people say that like, it's not worth it. Just go do what you want to love. I will sort of take the side of a pit stop is worth it. At least from my perspective to just kind of initiate like, kind of establish some level of branding. Whatever your definition of pit stop is. Some people define it as good school. Some people define it as first good job. But some way to establish like, some credibility. And then from there, just go risk. Go take crazy risk. I only mean like pit stop at a year or two. I won't do any longer, probably not shorter than a year, but I do think the pit stop was helpful. I also really think it depends on who you are when you're early career. You mentioned, you know, if you came out of school with a lot of insecurities or you have something to prove, going to a company that gives you a lot of prestige can help with self-confidence a lot. Mm-hmm. Absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? Whereas for me, I maybe my parents just from the get-go raised me super delusional, but I never had any doubts about me being smart or capable. And so I was very <laughs> okay with going to a no name yeah. startup with no big venture funding or anything because I was like, I'll just make it happen. Um, but I also think that like, going to a big company sometimes can be really helpful because some people need that structure first mm. to just learn how to do things. Yeah, I agree with that. I feel like I would not have been set up for success if it was not a big <laughs> company. I did not have that confidence coming in. I was very insecure. Yeah, that's a good point. It's probably not a right answer for it. It's like kind of everyone chooses for themselves. And so I guess now your father, congrats again. Do you think about your career differently now that I feel like maybe you have a dependent and a family? Dude, yeah, if I'm going to be super honest, I even had, I was like, okay, I have a kid. Should I make more money and financially support her or should I support her with my time? How, should, like, how else can I? Startups are tough on both fronts. Maybe I go back to Bain, maybe I try to pick some chiller corporate job and chill out. So I don't, I don't know if I have clarity on that yet. Mm-hmm. I did have that kind of crisis, but for now it feels like, uh, I can still kind of, I can still choose a career that I want. And then, I mean, the reality is I think people say, like, oh, what if one day I have a kid or what if one day I want to spend more time with her or mm-hmm. X, Y, Z, it's like, yeah, but when I, whenever you kind of have that confrontation, you can decide for it then. Don't decide for it early. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's still early where she doesn't need a ton from me yet, except for, like, you know, I have office of theater, play with her and all that stuff. But there isn't, I don't know, I feel like I'm sounding like a horrible father. But I don't think I need to make that decision yet. But I will say probably three, four years from now, I will kind of decide as I go. Mm-hmm. But the thing is also a lot of people that I know are still great parents, great partners, still do startups, still work a ton. I think you just have to be really disciplined with your time and you also just don't sleep as much. So I want to believe it's it's possible. I will say also the other super important thing, I don't think this is negotiable, is like you need a good partner that is willing to think of everything 50-50. Right. So whether it's child care, cleaning, dishes, whatever, it has to be 50-50 between the two partners. It doesn't matter your gender or whatever traditional girls roll guys really just split shit and right. that's the only way i think it'll really work and i'm super grateful for esther who helps me split everything uh hopefully she's grateful for me but maybe not <laughs> but yeah i think that's been super helpful for me to still explore my career it lets her explore her career while still mm-hmm. hopefully learning to be good parents and minimizing right. the amount of trauma i give her right and what's i mean if finding a partner is so important what would be your biggest dating tip for people Dating tip? No, 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 I'm going to get canceled for this because I was the worst dating. I was your guy who was <laughs> in the gray zone. Would be, I would have this thesis where it's like, as long as I'm honest with you that I'm never going to date you, it's your choice whether you want to continue or not. And most people just don't because they have this, I know, deep inside they want to continue. Uh, yeah. So I was horrible. The only reason Esther and I ended up together was because she's so one person only. I remember I was like, hey, Let's just see how it goes. Give it like a few months. Stay in the gray zone. Keep it open. Loosey goosey. And she's like, I had- if you're seeing me, you're not seeing anyone else. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I was like, yeah. In worst case, we become friends. And she, she, I, she, you know, she just goes, I have enough guy friends. I don't need any more. So I need to you to commit or not. And yeah. so I committed. Got so anxious. Broke up with her. And we were broken up with for a week. And then we got back together and then, you know, we still got, we're still together, but no, right. I, was, I have no dating tips. I'm probably the worst person to get, get d- dating advice from. I mean, well, I feel like it's like coming, you're like a reformed bad boy. So then at what point, when were you like, I'm ready. This is the one. Esther's the one for me. 
I wish I could say it was early in our relationship, but the reality was it was much later. I think I struggled with just everything of being in a committed relationship. And I went to a lot of therapy about it. And I think it also just helped having a good role model. There is the great example of somebody who is just very supportive, never toxic, never hits below the belt, never makes you feel an ounce of insecurity about anything. Mm -hmm. And I think I was not that. (laughs) So I have no idea why she wants to be with me. But I think for me, the positives were just so clear of trending towards that direction. But it was really tough, honestly, mostly for her. So I think she was taking the brunt of everything, whereas like, I'm on my journey to become a better person. So I, I wouldn't say I'm like 100% there yet in terms of being that person, but I hope to be. And then in terms of when I realized she's like the person probably like three years in, four years in, yeah, because of how exceptionally confident she made me, both in myself, my career, my like my ability to be her partner. And I was like, why, why do I feel so confident nowadays? And it's like, Oh, I secretly have this person gassing me up all the time. I probably shouldn't do that. And she's just a 10 out of 10 person. So I think that's when I realized. Um, but now I still feel a lot of guilt, especially as I have a daughter, around how I treated women, how I thought about women, how I treated Esther even. So we have this running joke where when Ella is an adult, I will tell her I've only dated one person, and that is her mom. And I will lie until she, I guess, watches this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> when she's older. Yeah. Oh, the traumatizing experience for her. That's okay. I'm ready for it. (laughs) Well, Eric, thank you so much for being on the podcast with me. And if you want to see more of Eric's content, you can find him on TikTok. I think his handle is L-E-P-O-M. Lepom? Lepom. Ron James, but Lepom James. Yes. He recently hit 10K and you'll find a mix of fatherhood, career, and gaming content on there. So go ahead and pop him a follow. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a like or a subscribe as well, as it really helps me push out more content since we're just starting. Okay. Thanks for having me. It was super fun.